The Rachel Maddow Show has recently had an international banking problem. But like all truly useful problems in the world, having this problem, not even solving this problem, just having this problem, has helped us at this show gain some valuable insight. In this case, into the, today's, into the most important story uh, in today's news. You may remember a story that we did recently about an awesome anti-Nazi T-shirt in Germany. A few months ago, we covered this story of a white power rock concert that was taking place in eastern Germany. And a genius anti-Nazi, anti-racism group decided to hand out these T-shirts at the rock show. The first 250 racist skinheads to enter that concert received these T-shirts, which aren't particularly overtly racist or anything, but they kind of look nationalist-ish. They have the right kind of skinheady iconography. The genius move here was that the anti-Nazi people developed some crazy T-shirt technology whereby once neo-Nazis proudly wore this T-shirt and then laundered them, when this T-shirt came out of the laundry, the T-shirt would no longer look vaguely and pleasingly racist, but instead, post-washing machine, it would look like this. Reading in German, quote, what your T-shirt can do, you also can do. We will help you free yourself from right-wing extremism. We covered this story back in August. We've since uh, been trying to get actual physical genius T-shirts from the anti-Nazi group that was distributing them. Uh, and in so doing, we have been developing an international banking problem. We have been wading through what it takes to wire money internationally. Turns out, in order to purchase 70 bucks worth of T-shirts, it's going to cost us $35, half that much money, just to move that money to Germany. That is typically what it costs to do an international money transfer between bank accounts. 30 or 40 bucks. And so today, when this happened, when there was a massive show of national security firepower in D.C., a suddenly convened press conference to announce a high-profile arrest in a case that reads like freaking Syriana, a spy movie plot to end all spy movie plots, because we on this show are in the middle of trying to work out our own stupid international banking $35 fee snafu, one specific part of this super complicated, fascinating thing made way more sense than it ought to have. On August 1st of this year, a 56-year-old Iranian-American with awesome hair, uh, who said he was acting as an intermediary for Iran's government, specifically for his cousin in the Iranian military and other high-ranking government officials, this guy allegedly arranged for this odd amount of money to be wired to a secret bank account, $49,960. About a week later, on August 9th, same deal. Same dude arranged for this specific amount of money, again, to be wired to that same secret bank account. Now, part of the reason this spy movie criminal complaint today was filed in a New York City court is because these bank transfers, even though they were starting presumably in Iran and going to a secret bank account somewhere else, these bank transfers went through Manhattan. They went through a New York City bank because almost all banking in the world, despite our financial catastrophe here, still pretty much goes through New York City. So the fact that that money stopped over in New York City in spitting distance of the Occupy Wall Street protesters, that is why this criminal case was brought today in New York. And while this is not a central part of the case, it is worth noting that Wall Street is also the reason why the amount of money this Iranian guy allegedly wired twice was such a weird amount. $49,960? What? We know from what were apparently tape-recorded conversations in this plot that what the Iranian guy was supposed to be sending was a hundred grand, a hundred thousand dollars. Clearly, he chose to send that money in two installments. But each time, Wall Street takes a pop. This is an international money transfer, so they skim 40 bucks every time you make a wire transfer like this. So, $49,960. Minus that 40 bucks twice, that $100,000 did move, leading to today's stranger-than-fiction bombshell national security announcement in D.C. The disruption of this alleged plot marks a significant achievement by our law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And though it reads like the pages of a Hollywood script, the impact would have been very real and many lives would have been lost. Today's charges should make crystal clear that we will not let other countries use our soil as their battleground. Not let other countries use our soil as their battleground. I wonder if Yemen feels the same way about us, uh, or Pakistan. Uh, never mind. Uh, but here's the, here's the stranger-than-fiction action movie plot that U.S. officials are alleging. On May 24th of this year, this American citizen, he's a, he's a dual citizen of both Iran and the United States, he traveled from Texas, where he lives, to Mexico, 
to go meet with someone from a Mexican drug cartel. It's not described in the complaint explicitly as being the Zetas cartel, but other people writing about this today report that the cartel this guy thought he was meeting with was the Zetas. He gets to Mexico, and this Iranian guy asks his contact in the drug cartel if the drug cartel guy is any good with explosives. The guy from the drug cartel replies, yes, he is. He's, in fact, great with C4 in particular. The Iranian guy then says that he's interested, among other things, in attacking an embassy of Saudi Arabia. Arabia. What the Iranian guy does not know at this point that the guy, is that the guy who he's meeting with from that drug cartel is an informant for the U.S. government. He is a person who was previously, quote, charged in connection with a narcotics offense by authorities of a certain U.S. state. In exchange for his cooperation in various narcotics investigations, the state charges were dismissed. And he is now paid by federal law enforcement officials uh, to be a rat. That's not the term they use, but that is essentially what he is. He's a paid informer inside the Mexican drug cartel. We have those, apparently, in American law enforcement. So the Iranian guy is meeting with a DEA informant who's in this Mexican drug gang. The informant then reports back to his handlers at the DEA that an Iranian guy has approached him about attacking a Saudi Arabian embassy, at which point the DEA calls in the FBI. The informant and the Iranian guy continue to meet through June and July, during which time the Iranian guy clarifies that he doesn't just want the embassy attacked, he wants the ambassador killed. He wants the Saudi ambassador to the U.S. murdered, assassinated, while the ambassador is in the U.S. And at a meeting between the Iranian guy and the informant in July, the informant, just like in the movies, uh, he wears a wire. At that meeting, the Iranian guy says in English that the money he's going to use to pay the drug cartel to kill the ambassador, that, quote, money is in Iran. The Iranian guy then explains that it's his cousin in the Iranian army who's asked him to find somebody to mount this assassination. He describes his cousin as a big general in the army who was, quote, wanted in America and had, in his words, been on the CNN Uh, At a follow-up meeting a few days later, the informant says in English on tape, quote, I don't know exactly what your cousin wants me to do. The Iranian guy replies, quote, he wants you to kill the guy, talking about the ambassador, to which the informant says, there's going to be like American people there in the restaurant where he's planning the assassination. You want me to do it outside or in the restaurant? The Iranian guy answers, doesn't matter how you do it. According to the complaint, on numerous occasions during that meeting, the Iranian made it clear that the assassination needed to go forward, even if doing so would cause mass mass casualties. The informant quotes him as saying, quote, they want that guy done, meaning they want the ambassador killed. Quote, if the hundred go with him, F him. And again, the complaint alleges that the Iranian makes clear that the money to finance this operation is not some freelance thing, not some independent terrorist group. Talking about his cousin in the army again, he says, quote, he's got the government behind him. He's not paying from his pocket, meaning the Iranian government. And at that point, as far as he's concerned, the plan goes into motion. This Iranian guy believes he is now contracted with a Mexican drug cartel to kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States in the United States, probably in a restaurant in Washington, D.C., using a bomb. He makes a $100,000 down payment, minus two wire transfer fees of 40 bucks. makes that payment on the eventual $1.5 million cost of the job. He makes plans to finish the deal and to skedaddle, to get out of town, to go back to Iran. And with that guy on tape, in English, making the arrangements for the killing, making the arrangements for the payment, tying it all to the government of Iran, and having now completed the wire transfer, the FBI and the DEA sew him up, announcing today the arrest of this American citizen at JFK Airport in New York as he was trying to get back to Iran. He allegedly confessed to U.S. authorities after being read his Miranda rights. He will now be tried in the Southern District of New York. The Iranian government already denouncing these charges laid out today as America trying to distract from its own problems. But from the Obama administration's perspective, this is not being treated as an average run-of-the-mill bumbling true believer terrorist plot, not being treated as just a criminal complaint, although it is that too. The Obama administration is treating this as a major international incident, which is what it seems like it is becoming and quickly. In addition to holding these individual conspirators accountable for their alleged role in this plot, the United States is committed to holding Iran accountable for its actions. It remains to be seen exactly what the United States is going to do and how this ends. 
But looming over this whole story, over this whole dramatic press conference and the bombshell complaint today and the international incident this has now become, is the fact that the reason this came down this way is apparently because the DEA had a well-placed informant inside what appears to be the Zetas drug cartel. And they did not keep this information to themselves once they were approached by this Iranian guy. The dots were connected, the arrest was made, the suspect confessed, the trial will be held. In a world where plots like this are not just pot boiler fiction, from a law enforcement and a counterterrorism perspective, this is the way this is supposed to go. Want another one? Here's the former Soviet Union. Really big, right? Uh, here's a tiny little part of the former Soviet Union that is now known as Moldova. One of the things that's really relevant to American security today from the former Soviet Union uh, is the uranium and plutonium left behind by the Soviet's giant nuclear program when the Soviet Union fell apart. One of the things that U.S. officials do, U.S. government personnel do in the spy versus spy world that we live in is that they try to track down all the old Soviet uranium and plutonium so it doesn't end up getting sold on the black market to terrorist groups. Terrorist groups looking for a nuclear weapon or enough uranium or plutonium to make one on their own or, or just for enough highly radioactive material to explode a dirty bomb which is essentially radioactive shrapnel and conventional explosives. In Moldova in June, local police who had been trained by American authorities identified a ring of people who were trying to sell 20 pounds of highly enriched uranium and some unknown quantity of plutonium. That much uranium could get you well on your way toward making your own homegrown nuclear bomb. The Associated Press reporting that the asking price was about $30 million. The arranged buyer of at least a sample of the uranium was a North African man who has not yet been found, nor has one kilogram of highly enriched uranium that these authorities still think is out there and in criminal hands and for sale because there is a functioning black market on which terrorist groups are shopping for uranium and plutonium. But thanks to the U.S. doing this work, prioritizing this, having a presence in somewhere as random as Moldova, this uranium has been tracked to its source. This uranium and plutonium ring has started to be shut down. There have been arrests. That, this, is, this is the way it's supposed to work. This is why the U.S. government does this kind of work. How about one more? Tonight, we on this show can exclusively report that the United States government has completed a top-secret mission to secure and dispose of more than 70 pounds of highly enriched uranium in the nation of Kazakhstan. That's enough highly enriched uranium to build an improvised nuclear bomb. As we have discussed on this show before, we have an agency in the federal government, the National Nuclear Security Administration, whose job it is to find and lock down loose nuclear material all over the world to make sure that material stays out of the hands of terrorists and off the black market. What you're looking at right now are exclusive images nobody else has from the NNSA's latest mission to Kazakhstan. NNSA officials, U.S. government officials alongside the Kazakhs, they spent the last seven weeks working in secret to secure and transport about 72 pounds of weapons-grade uranium, the most valuable substance on Earth if you ask your local rich terrorist group. In a mission planned over the course of two years, this highly radioactive nuclear material was packed up and moved more than 750 miles across that country, where we can now report it has finished being down-blended. It's been down-blended into low-enriched uranium, which means that it can no longer be used to make a nuclear weapon. This is what the NNSA does every single day. This is what your government is doing. In the last year and a half alone, the NNSA has downblended more than 55,000 kilograms of nuclear material, enough to build over 2,000 nuclear weapons. They are the ones who are keeping this material off the nuclear black market for the world and for America. They are the ones keeping this stuff out of the hands of terrorists who are actively trying to get it and have millions of dollars to spend to do it. That is the way it's supposed to work. Next time you hear somebody talking smack about the government, about the whole idea of government doing something useful, you have your rejoinder. These are your tax dollars at work. Thank God.